Hey there, tribe. Welcome to episode six of the Czarcast. I'm your host, Dante B8. And with me tonight, yes, we are recording at night, a little bit of a change due to our uh, guest schedule, are my quiet, riot-loving co-hosts. First up, my man here will hopefully keep us all from going crazy now and banging our heads over unpredictable crypto market by teaching us something new in the crypto corner. How's it going, D22? Hey, what's up, Dante? How's, how's everyone doing today? I'm excited for our next episode of the Zardcast. And yeah, we're going to talk crypto. We're going to talk furs and everything in between. So uh, let's get to it. Nice. And of course, I know you're all as anxious as I am to learn the current trends on OpenSea, see what new things he's going to teach us about, and get this week's picks for best kawakas for sale and a new surprise uh, this week. Come on, feel the noise for Mr. Positive Q. Thank you. Thank you, Dante. Excited to be here as always. Love hanging out with everybody. Love talking about kawakas. Got a little special thing talking about another project today, but we'll get into that in a minute. And also a little lead in to uh, our next episode with the fur matching for the Kawaka kids that I know everybody's excited about. So looking forward to talking to everybody today. Awesome. Yeah. So I decided that um, based on tonight's guest, that this episode, episode six, is the Zarcast music episode. My own music taste can best be described as old guy eclectic. Um, I love pretty much everything that came out of the 80s. Uh, Also, oldies, random, weird, old, very old songs. Um, All of the MTV music from Lionel Richie to Twisted Sister. That that was part of the TV routine for us growing up in my house. You sat on the couch or laid on the floor and just sort of clicked through all the cable movie stations watching those same movies over and over. And then at some point, you just settled in on MTV. And uh, you just hope to catch the new Van Halen or Genesis video, and and it was awesome. The videos, they just kept getting better and better. Michael Jackson always killed it with his videos. Congrats to the owner of that legend, by the way. It's spectacular. And I also, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that's being paired with a zombie um, for the the Quokka kid. So I think that's going to be brilliant. But yeah. To me, like music has always seemed to have this like strange power, right? Like the first few times you hear a song that you really like, it has like this incredible effect on you. And then the more you hear it, that power sort of weakens until it just kind of like wears off entirely. And there's only like a few songs that maintain their power forever. So how about you, Positive Q? What is your music choice? Oh, God, Uh, I was not prepared for this. But uh, I am actually a huge fan of two different and very different styles of music. I am a fan of country music, as as I always have been. Um, A lot of people my age, you know, country music is the new classic rock. (laughs) But I am also a fan of old school hip hop. Um, If if I am uh, trying to get myself pumped up or just need a happy feeling going on, like a little run DMC. You will see me going in a minute. I will sing along. I know every word to it. And uh, yeah, I love the old school hip hop from back in the day. Anything from really old. So like Run DMC, Herbie Hancock, things like that, all the way through, you know, uh, you know, through Tupac and Biggie. And that was about where I started to lose it and got really into country at that point. But I still love that genre of music. Wow, that's awesome. Yeah, my country music only extends as far as Kenny Rogers. That's it. <laughs> He's I still have, a classic. Yeah, I absolutely love Kenny Rogers. Uh, Kenny Rogers would be an incredible legend. Um, yeah, but I Butombo could have used you at Wildwood uh, the other day because he was on the microphone for hours. So, yeah, you, you could have jumped in and done some run DMC with him. I'm sure he would have appreciated a little break. I, I've, I've seen Butombo in action a few times. I don't, I don't think he needs me at all. So. <laughs> yeah, I saw man. I, I think I missed that, Dante. I saw him in New York. Uh, you know, spent some some verses, and uh, yeah, he is pretty good. Yeah. Um, how okay? Well, D, how about you? What do you listen to? Um, I actually listen mostly to worship music now. You know, I'm in, in and out of church, and uh, but my preference of uh, genres would be like classic, classic, classic rock. I like my dad when I grew up as a kid. He was always playing the Beatles and the Doors and 
so I grew up listening to that. I like it a lot. Um, I like reggae. I like Spanish rock. I like uh, salsa, especially since my wife, she loves to dance salsa and she loves to uh, listen to salsa music. So, um, yeah, that's pretty much I'm not I'm not much of a music nerd. Uh, you know, I, I'll, play, I'll I'll listen to whatever, you know, whoever wants to listen to something. I, I'm, I'm happy with that. But yeah, I, I guess, I, you know, to get pumped up, like uh, like Brian said, too, I I can dig some Tupac, you know, uh, some reggaeton from back in the day or uh, Kryptonite. Uh, I forget who plays that in the band. But yeah, anyway, yeah, that's that's pretty much my style. Public Enemy. That's my that's my hip hop. Public Enemy. Nice. OK. <laughs> um, all right. So you mentioned Rose your lovely wife, who I finally got to meet, and um, talking about Wildwood Quack, there was, uh, I mean, it was a great time from start to finish, but that that was uh, the highlight for me, was when my wife, Laura, got to meet your wife, Rose, and I, and I you know, got to see my wife just having fun and laughing, um, just talking to your wife, because, you know, this has been a crazy, few months right and uh, you know the three of us are like super involved and so you know we we need the support of our wives and we have to actually you know take a take a minute to to remember you know that that they're there too you know and we're just looking at kawakas all day long so, <laughs> yeah yeah for me that was like a okay cool like she's having fun you know with this particular uh person at this at this moment so that was really cool so yeah we're looking forward to uh meeting up with you guys again in person and brian and his wife of course as well we, yeah we, man that's that sounds like a plan i know rose uh that was my highlight too man seeing both our wives uh just laughing and, and having a good time and listen it's it's true like we get carried away as men and we do it with the coagas but we do it with a lot of things too you know we get carried away and uh, you know thank god for our wives our better halves they they reel us back in they talk some sense into us and they help us uh you know have a little bit more of a uh balanced lifestyle i'd say but yeah it was funny uh them joking about you know us uh you know dante and i talking about quagas all the time and uh you know so my i think the girls are gonna start a club that is uh let's talk about anything except quaggas and that's the club. And, uh, yeah, I heard a lot of our ladies were interested in it, <laughs> especially the wives of the, of the holders. I know we have some ladies that are holders and that's awesome. Uh, but yeah, some of the wives uh, get tired of hearing about it. <laughs> yeah. Well, even leading up to the event, the uh, Thursday before the three of us got together and uh, we met up with a couple other uh, big time players over in the czar with uh, Mello and Mathematics. Um, and so, and then your friend, uh, what's, I don't know what his JJ name is. Mills. JJ Mills, yeah. And then we had the special, um, the surprise visit from Dr. Doofus as well. So that, and that was an awesome time too. So that's always really nice when you, you know, you have a group of friends that you do something with, right? And then, you know, that it works out great when you're doing that one thing that you all have in common. But then when you can actually meet outside of that thing and realize like, oh, I actually really like these people just as people too. Like not just in this one little, you know, microcosm world that we're in together. So, yeah. So that was awesome too. Yeah, that was actually a ball. I mean, honestly, getting together with everybody and talking about everything. Yeah, we talked about Kawakas. We, we were joking around about other projects. Um, we, we had talks about life and, and personal goals and aspirations and, and what we all do outside of Kowakas. It was very enlightening because a lot of times we know each other in a box. Yeah. And to, to learn about everybody else outside of that box and to genuinely enjoy their company and have a great time for a couple hours was a lot of fun for me. It was not only enlightening but also entertaining and i can't thank everybody was there enough yeah it was it was great because you know as as fun as this project has been and it's and it's awesome and it's exciting there is also an a, an element of of stress to it you know there's some you know you're a little bit nervous sometimes with things going on and you know i got booted out of discord the other day for i don't even know how or why thank <laughs> Melo was there to sort of get me back in i, I still don't even know what happened but wow. um, yeah so I, I, you know, I 100% am, you know, betting it's user error. You know, I'm sure I did something that I wasn't like, I hit like uh, Dr. Doofus said I must've deleted my account somehow, but I, I don't, I don't know what I did, 
but yeah so like all of that freaked me out because then right away i'm like uh oh am i like hacked like am i gonna mess other people up that are talking with me like you know so i just i'm stressed a lot um and then so like in that environment it's like here's all these same people and i'm just laughing and and like uh like pq just said we're not just talking about kawakas we're just talking about all kinds of topics and it was just fun. It was just a great time. So hopefully we keep that going and we hopefully we're joined by more people, whoever's around, you know, different, different spots and different people. It'd be awesome. Absolutely. I'd love to run out of chairs and have to book a couple other tables at one of those events. So that was a good time. Absolutely, yeah. man. Yeah. We're going to do it again for sure. Nice. All right. Well, so that brings us to the point of the show where Mr. D22 breaks down what's going on in the crypto market and we're seeing a little dip right now in ethereum um i'm kind of grateful because it's letting me uh get the land that i need so uh d why don't you take us into the crypto corner all right yeah this is uh the next edition of d22's crypto corner and uh yeah just like you said dante we have ethereum uh sitting at uh 1370 uh give or take there is uh there's some building resistance around that 400 uh 1400 mark 1500 mark and then there's heavy resistance uh passing the 16. uh yeah it's anyone's guess what's going to happen with ethereum but if i if i had to if i had to guess i would say there's probably going to be a little bit more pain uh more downside and uh close to the thousand market hopefully would uh would jump back around a thousand dollars there's very strong support so i don't see it going much lower than that but you never know in the crypto world right uh it's as volatile so i say it's like it's like stocks on steroids so once you get into crypto man stocks move slow you know the stock market it opens at 9 30 it closes at five and uh i know you have some a little bit of aftermarket action but it's not like the crypto 24 7 and these big swings um but yeah man I wanted to touch today on uh, smart contracts. It's a, it's a term that, uh, that's thrown out there a lot in the crypto world. I'm, uh, you know, I don't understand it completely. And I know there's a lot of people that have no clue what that means. In its basic sense, the smart contract is whatever language, you know, whatever uh, code was written into the contract for X given project. But what I wanted to go into deep today was a smart contract uh, use real world use case. Uh, I like bringing up uh, use cases and, and projects that are actually doing something that solves a problem in the real world. And that's where, you know, groundbreaking technology that is used to benefit, you know, society or to, uh, you know, uh, fix a problem that, that wasn't fixable without this uh, technology, then, you know, that's when, when the investment becomes a real good investment because now you can see, you know, uh, black and white, you can see what the project actually does. So anyway, there's a, a token called Chainlink. It's built on Ethereum. And what they do, they are an Oracle. So they bring Chainlink, what they uh, set out to do is bring real world information onto the blockchain. And so you have the component of uh, not having a governing authority, uh, making the decisions that can be tampered with. And then you have a uh, proof of ownership, uh, which is all part of uh, the blockchain. And then uh, with Chainlink, you can feed real, real world information on chain. So I want to I wanna just real, very quickly describe this one real interesting use case. So uh, Sergio Navarro, the guy that uh, invented Chainlink, He's been, uh, you know, in the in the crypto world ever since Bitcoin uh, was was invented, and he has a lot of years of experience. He he thinks that in the future, most every single important contract will be a smart contract written on blockchain, and there's just some properties to these contracts that are superior to you know just the the regular type of contract agreement that we do now that you just sign. And you have all the uh, all the all the do's and don'ts are on the paper. You sign it, but then at the end of the contract, uh, whoever has to act on the results of it, it it's kind of blurry uh, in many cases of how how to execute the contract. Um, so I'm gonna give an example of a storage uh, uh, a container, a shipping container that's refrigerated, right? And you want to buy insurance on your shipment. 
So you're shipping a container, refrigerated container from California to uh, Mexico. I, I, let's say, yeah, anyway, the, the, the point is this. You're able with IoT devices, which are devices that detect uh, different things in, in the world. You can have a you can have an IoT device inside the container that's detecting the temperature all throughout the the container's uh, trajectory uh, until final destination. And so, on a smart contract in code, you can write that if the uh, container has any type of damage because of weather control, because of climate control then you know the person that's paying for the insurance gets paid x amount for that container right and in a traditional sense you would sign that document but if actually something happens to the merchandise uh you would need someone to come investigate the situation you would need the other party to confirm that they're willing to pay this insurance and so what smart contracts do is they read everything on chain all right so let's say i have a smart contract with this container i put insurance on it cost me a uh, thousand bucks to insure my container. And in the, co in the smart contract, we agreed that if the IoT device detects uh, a temperature that goes higher than let's say 70 degrees, that determines that my merchandise is now uh, unusable, it's damaged and I, and I am able to claim my insurance money, okay? So all this is, is able to be done on a smart contract with no human interaction, the, the literally the container will be tracked from point A to point B. The, the temperature will be tracked. And if there's any damage, it'll automatically trigger a payment to the person that purchased the insurance. And so, so that's why it's called a smart contract. You can put all the terms, you can put all the bells and whistles in order, and you can even have it activate itself uh, if certain uh, conditions met. Um, another quick example, you can, you can ensure uh, your farm in Africa, you know, there's some regions in Africa that's very hard to find an insurance, especially a legit insurance company. So with smart contracts, you're able to feed uh, uh, the information about the weather in that particular uh, area, right? And there's uh, dozens and dozens of different sources telling what the weather was in that area at any given time. And so and that way, you can also write a smart contract that would trigger if there was rain for X amount of time, and uh, that data is triggered into the smart contract. Then it'll 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 state that the you know the field was damaged, and you you um, you are due your payment on your insurance. Anyway, those are two fun examples of smart contracts. Uh, one last uh, real fun one that that centrifuge is another project that. What they are doing is they're bringing real world assets on chain. So they're bringing the proof of ownership of let's say a business or uh, maybe invoices that you have pending or maybe royalties that are paid out, you know, uh, once a year or every couple of months you get royalties. So you bring the proof of ownership of these assets on chain. And now you can uh, take loans uh, using those assets as collateral. And so this particular centrifuge company, they have you know, around $90 million in assets on chain and people can do uh, decentralized finance activities like taking loans or lending out money for, for interest gain uh, using this type of smart contract. So with that, I'll, I'll leave you guys uh, with some interesting for information about blockchain technology and this edition of uh, Crypto Corner. Thank you. Thank you, D. I, I, you know, I, I agree with that last part where you said some interesting things, but I disagree with the part where you said some fun things about that. that you're the only one I know that, well, maybe PQ, he probably thinks this is a little bit fun too. That like <laughs> kind of stuff, my mind is just burning, like the gears in my brain, just trying to like get around all of this stuff. It's just like, oh, what? Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I, like that. But yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't know how that's fun, but. PQ, <laughs> I, I I think it's great because I think like all of us, um, I'm new to a lot of this stuff, and to to listen to D22 talk about it um, on these podcasts, I learn something every time. So I actually put myself on mute because you may not know, but I'm sitting here writing notes while he's doing it, and so I didn't want to make any noise. But I I think the stuff that D22 brings every week is is I don't know if fun would be the word, but exciting, <laughs> exciting in a sense of learning and adventure would be the word, um, because I, I really enjoy what he brings every week. I enjoy knowing 
about not only NFTs and crypto, but what's behind them and what all this means in a broader sense, because I think it helps all of us when making decisions down the road. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah that's and that's the thing. Like uh, my my whole revelation with uh, blockchain was uh, people just look at the word cryptocurrency. They just assume, OK, currency, it's a currency. What do you know about currencies? You know, the American dollar, whatever other currency you're familiar with. And that's all you know. But like uh, uh, blockchain technology is much more the the cryptocurrency is actually just a way of securing the network but and, and incentivize uh you know a decentralized system and we can get into that on another episode but anyway basically i'm trying my best to like highlight these interesting facts that that show you a little bit more depth of what this technology can actually accomplish yeah no you're killing it i i, I just am like so far behind in this space with all of that like i'm just like whoa okay um all right well Thank you, D22. And this brings us to the Positive Q Open C Report. Thank you very much. I will get right in it after after that. Once again, wonderful information dump by D22 there. I want to go over what happened in the past two weeks. So let's go over that first. Um, what we've seen over the past two weeks is 8.9 ETH in volume traded in the last seven days with an average floor price of or I'm sorry, an average price of 0.44. Both of these were fallbacks from the previous week of 12.2 uh, and an average price of 5.7. Um, I think we're seeing exactly what I talked about the week before. Um, I think as ETH went up, um, you started to see a dip. People, if they didn't already have the ETH in their wallet, then they were um, having to buy it, which means taking more money out of your bank account or however you fund your your uh, your wallet. And uh, I, I think we definitely saw a dip out of that. And now that ETH has come back down a little bit, I think D22 has mentioned in the past that we may dip a little bit more if they break through support at, I think it's the next one is 1200. Uh, D22, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah, that's that's pretty close. Yeah. Okay, so if they break through twelve hundred, then I think we may see a fallback even into the you know low thousands or even nine hundred again, and then you'll start to see the the numbers peak back up. Um, a lot of it correlates into people have only so much money to spend. They don't get paid from their job in ETH. They get paid from their job in dollars, <laughs> and it all matters when they buy it. Um, so there's there's a lot of that to keep in mind when you're correlating the markets. But that's what we've seen in the past couple of weeks. Uh, I want to take a time and highlight a couple of guacas that I see on the floor, as I always try and do for everybody all week. We have a very thin floor right now. It's almost interesting to look at as I really tried to dig into it today. Um, there's there's a five kawakas listed in the the high threes to low fours and as soon as you get above that you start quickly jumping up and when i looked at it today i really tried to take some time i try and bring some value to everybody that's on this or listening to this uh recording but at the numbers below from about one eth down there's some great Kwok is in there. There's some great art in there. There's a lot of great stuff, but I'm not seeing what I try and bring to everybody every week is I'm not seeing investment value. I'm seeing that if you like it, you want to own it, you want to buy into the project. I think this is a perfect time to do it. The, the numbers down there are low. You can get something cool. You can get something you like, but I'm not seeing the investment value. So I had to go a little higher this week to find some investment value. And this is where I did it. So I got two of them for you today. Both of them are right at one, at one ETH right now. So $1,300, which I still think is a great value, by the way. So at $1,300, the first one I want to talk about is $1,543. So this is a suede jacket. Um, he has a uh, sailor's cap on with that grin and the uh, cigar in his mouth. And I, I always talk about how I like the look. I like the matching look of Kawakas. I like it when all the art comes together. And this guy just reminds me of, of somebody like the old Navy guy that, that you see. And, you know, he's got the angry grin. He's got the sailor hat, but he's got that cigar. 
it was like everybody's dad when he used to yell at him back in the day. Um, so yeah. I, I, I really, I really like this guy. I like the look of him. There's been a lot of talk in the czar lately in the channel, the czar, not in the czar cast of, um, the cigar trait. And you haven't seen a lot of them. People like the look of it. People like to hold on to them. There's been a couple on the market lately. And I know I talk about them way too much for somebody who's not on this podcast, but ghost of sushi man picked up a couple over the weekend and it was a great snag by him. Yeah. So, um, you know, I really like that one. So I would say at exactly one ETH, uh, 1543 is a great buy. 1543. Sec- I'm sorry, Brian, uh, pausing to cut you off. 1543. I'm looking at him right now. And, and it reminds me, like, it's kind of like what you said. It, it looks like uh, his wife just dragged him out to a, a, a party that he does not want to attend. Yeah, right? ab- absolutely. Like, he, he looks like he's mad at something. Yeah, put on but- your one. Oh, and and let's go yeah so yeah i i really like that guy i like the look of him um there was one that somebody uh was messaging me about last night and he he wanted to buy it was another one with a cigar trait and i saw it i didn't even see it on the floor i hadn't done my research for the show yet and i told him right on there on the message i said if you don't buy that thing in 30 minutes i'm going to <laughs> so um he went on and got it anyway so um spared spared myself the uh money but uh he he picked that up last night that cigar trait is hot right now and next one i want to talk about 3922 at 1.1 so this is a tie-dyed shirt the uh seashell necklace a uh you know the the sun hat and the uh the uh modern glasses the modern sunglasses and this guy is a steel fur kawaka. And he is another one that really the look goes together. He looks awesome. He is cool. He's got a lot of traits that you don't see. You don't see a lot of the tie-dyed shirt going on the market. You don't see a lot of that style of glasses. Usually you have the red glasses that I, um, I know people are specifically a person is after all the time. And you see a lot of the old school glasses, but you don't see like these modern like aviator shades a lot. And it's it's a really cool look on this guy. Um, you know, if you wanted a little backstory, he looks like, you know, he almost reminds me of like the the uh, the Australian guy just coming off the beach. And, uh, you know, he wants to party. So I really like the look of this one. Thirty nine twenty two at one point one, um, which is still a great price, still a great value. He does. I, I think I met this guy actually in Florida back in November. I went there with my wife's family. And uh, and there was a guy that looked like this exact outfit, mm-hmm. and he was like, walking along right where the right where the uh, shoreline was, and I just was like, "What are you doing?" You know, and he was what he what it was was the the beach in a in a storm had washed away this one particular beach um, in like Jupiter, Florida, and they were repairing the beach by pumping sand from the bottom of the ocean, and they were just making a beach again, and the effect that it had was. They were hitting um, ancient shark fossils, and they were just pouring them out onto the beach. So they they were going around. Co- people were going around collecting these like tiny black shark teeth that were like I don't know thousands of years old. So it was pretty awesome. I didn't find any, but I I, I found this kawaka. That's that would be it. awesome. I would I would be all over that. Not only finding the kawaka, but the uh, <laughs> you know you figure you know sharks are older than dinosaurs, so you know there's probably a couple of million year old teeth in there. So Good that would that would be really cool. Yo, and yep. talking about sharks, uh, yeah, and I know you mentioned it briefly, but shout out to Ghost of Sushiman uh, sweeping that floor as we all uh, arrived at the beach, uh, Wildwood, and were disconnected from our devices. Man, uh-huh. this dude came in. Uh, yeah, pretty sharp. I, 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 I uh, saw yeah. I saw that move by Ghost. That was actually quite <laughs> impressive. I was I was happy with him that day. I so, was too, yeah. But I brought this guy up for a very specific reason. Um, not only do I think there's value there, but I want to talk about his fur. He's steel fur. And there has been a lot of talk within not only this podcast, not only within the Czar channel, but within Tribe Kawaka in general about the matching of the uh, Kawaka kids. And I have been working for weeks on a project. I worked with um, with Dr. Dick on it. They gave me the percentages, the rarities, what everybody's going to be looking at. That was nice of him to do that. And it wasn't to help me out. Um, you know, I'm the same as everybody else. It was to give the information to everybody on here. And I, I'm very thankful that he allowed me to do it through this podcast. But 
um, when, you know, when we look at the steel fur and we look at those things, I'm going to give you uh, my takes on it next week. But what I want to tell everybody and what I want everybody to listen into is I am not going to recommend that you match most furs. And I'll just give a little hint that the steel is going to be a cutoff line. And, you know, when we talk about those matches, we're going to go through them next week. We're going to have a couple of categories. We're going to have definitely match um, 50-50. We're going to have hold. And then we're also going to have a final category of possibly don't do a Kawaka kid and wait for later value because I believe that the Kawakas are going to, that haven't been paired just like unmutated apes um, hold value. And I think there's going to be a lot there to uh, discuss. So I'm going to go through all that next week. That's my little segue into that. And, and what do they call it in radio appointment setting? So for the next episode of the Zarcast, we are appointment setting for PQ's match on Kawaka kid fur. Has that, uh, PQ, has that question come up if there's a deadline to when uh, you can pair? Uh, no, you do not have to pair at any point. Um, so if you have two Kawakas, as you are eligible, as long, you can, you can. I don't even think you have to match them. Any any Kawaka that has not been paired. So let's say you have five in your wallet, yeah. and you pair four and make two Kawaka kids and you have a odd man out, then he can just be unpaired. But a year from now, you find somebody else that also has an unpaired, you can like, you can match them then. And, oh, you know, know the okay. blockchain, the blockchain never forgets and it will know whether it's matched or not. Gotcha. So um, there's that. So that's my appointment setting for next week. I'm actually very happy that our guest is on the line because I have a very special PQ floor report to go on today. Um, so uh, I don't know. I, I assume our guest has not heard our podcast, although I have heard her many a time. But um, I go through and I talk about um, what I see on OpenSea over the past week. And I talk about volume and E-Traded and what the average price was. But I also try and find some value on the floor where I think that there is something available on open sea that in my opinion is at a great price that delivers short and long-term value to its holder that you know somebody maybe need is in need of liquidity and wants to move on and, and everybody's right they own it they can sell anything they want um but you know uh there's a lot of investors in all these communities that want to pick something up so i'm very happy that our guest is on so uh what i am looking at today is we are looking at Violetta Zeroni's moonshot. So I have just given away the secret of who our guest is today. But um, we, uh, I took some time today and, and went over the project. What I saw, I minted a moonshot that was way back in the beginning. So, and, and you know, I haven't really gone on OpenSea every day to look at what's going on as I do for Tribe Kawaka. Um, you know, the, the songs are amazing. The art is amazing. But... Uh, I haven't really tracked it as much. So I took some time today and dug into it. And I, I have to make a comment first that I, I went on, I picked a um, an NFT that I, I thought was excellent. I liked the song. I liked the art. Um, I looked over all the sales in the past 90 days and saw what was going on. And by the time I had flipped back from the sales, that NFT was already sold and gone. So I said, <laughs> all right, you know what? good for Violetta. I'm going to do this again <laughs> and I'm going to go on. So I went on and found another one that I still found value in. And I went on, I started looking at the trades, seeing what was going on. And within 10 minutes of me finishing and posting it to my clipboard so I can talk about it today, that one was also gone. So, and my third attempt of finding a moonshot with some value on the floor, I have, I have just checked 10 minutes ago it is still available so i can't guarantee anything by the time this podcast comes out but major kudos to violetta zaroni and the amount of nfts and eth that her project is turning because it is not easy to go back and forth and constantly find these so if i look at via Zaloni, <laughs> violetta zaroni's project over the last seven days um, they have traded a higher volume in ETH than Tribe Kawaka has. 
um, they have traded 10.6 ETH over the past uh, seven days. So kudos to that project and the people in it, especially because you're looking at an average seven day price of 0.21. Um, really an, an amazing feat from a dedicated community who likes seeing the art, likes hearing the music, likes the utility that comes with the music. It's, it's been amazing to look at and read. I minted my, the one I had for really because I, I heard Violetta in Spaces. Um, she might be the hardest working individual in the Web3 environment these days. Um, I, I assume still in Italy, possibly lives in Germany now, I'm not positive, but was on spaces, I think 24 hours a day, um, maybe slept like for 10 minutes while somebody else was talking, I'm not sure, but <laughs> did amazing work. I was happy to mint with her and uh, you know this, this project is really doing well. So for my positive Q floor pick of Moonshot, I have Moonshot 2495 and I picked this one today it is the night sky background with the uh, cat and the, the rain in the art. Um, so the frame on it is Rose Quartz, but really I like that picture. I think it matches the song really well, <clears throat> which is the, uh, I apologize, I'm gonna get this wrong. Sometimes, always Violetta, you're gonna have to fill me in on this one. Never, rarely, sometimes, always. There we go, thank you. <laughs> oh, so, so that I, I enjoy that song. I, I like listening to it. It was the one that I have when I minted. Um, but I think it's a great song. I like the art on that one. And as I look over the last 90 days, this piece of art um, with that song seems to be moving quicker and at a higher rate than the rest of her collection, not anything against the rest of her collection. When I saw it and I saw this one sitting at 0.19, I thought this was a great value that uh, people are gonna find in the project. Somebody wants to get in on a project that has amazing utility moving forward. Um, so I'm going to recommend for the Moonshot Collection 2495, currently sitting on the floor at OpenSea at 0.19. So uh, thank you very much for, I enjoyed looking at your project. I enjoyed going through it. I enjoyed trying to break down. I know you're not in, uh, entirely familiar with what we do here, but we try and vote in, approach uh, NFT projects from the investing perspective, from the sales and buying perspective. And I really enjoyed breaking all yours down. So thank you very much for giving me a chance to look at it. Awesome job by Positive Q here. Not only uh, doing the Tribe Kawaka Open Sea Report, but also uh, in honor of our amazing guest, Violetta Zaroni, looking into the Moonshot Collection and giving you guys some insight on which ones you should be looking for. So, um, well, she's here. So let's all welcome Violetta Zaroni to the Zarcast. How are you? Hi guys, so good to be here. I'm great. Thank you so much for that. That was amazing. That was so accurate as well. Uh, thanks for looking into like the collection so thoroughly and finding a piece that, you know, you thought was valuable and 100% you're right. That specific song always has a way higher floor than the other ones. And I'm wondering why maybe people resonate with a song more than the other ones. I'm not sure. It happens to be my favorite one too. So I'm glad you shared the sentiment and uh, yeah, I'm just super happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Oh, you're welcome. So, so Violetta, just so you know, um, Positive Q is an absolute wizard when it comes to breaking down the NFTs that sell the best and, and the reasons why. So if you ever are truly curious about why that one's selling, just give him like 10 minutes and he'll let you know. He'll figure it out and, and get right back to you on that. Oh, but, wow. uh, I'll take you up on that for sure. Yeah, I, I do. I do want to say this uh, positive Q. I know, you know, what we pay you right now is not that much. But Violeta, I think it's zero, by the way, uh, if you want to put it out there. <laughs> Violetta, please don't, you know, don't try to go and hire positive Q and take them from the Zarcast because we would not survive. <laughs> I will be respectful, of course. <laughs> All right. So how how did you get involved in Tribe Kawaka? Well, uh, that's a good question. So I got involved within Tribe Kawaka because I was, I think we were leading up to my mint, to my moonshot mint. And um, I received a DM on Twitter from Bizzle, right? From Tribe Kawaka mm -hmm. saying, I really love what you guys were doing. 
Um, you know, I was hosting spaces with uh, Nifty Sachs, who's my project manager, part of my team. And Bizzle said, I'm part of a community called Tribe Kawaka. And we minted out like less than a month ago because this was in April, right? This was at the end of April. So I believe Tribe Kawaka minted out like first week of April or something. Correct. Um, yeah. yeah. So we're we're new, but, you know, we're doing well. And I feel like uh, it'd be great to have you guys on our space and talk about your project. I think your community would be really interested. So uh, I took them up on it and, you know, Bizzle Spaces, uh, the Tribe Kuaka Spaces are on Tuesdays, I believe, but they're at like 3 a.m. my time. I'm, yes, wow. indeed Italian, but I live in Germany, in Berlin. So I remember just like being almost about to go to bed and I was like, oh, hold on, let me check out this Tribe Kuaka thing. So I, <laughs> I went in and um yeah, I liked the vibes immediately. It was very friendly. Like I felt like everyone knew each other, you know. I only after learned the history of Tribe Kowak and how organically it was born, but it I really felt it before I even knew the actual story of the onboarding and everything. It felt like these guys were childhood friends. And um, Brett, right, Dick Doofus was very like kind and welcoming to me. And I played a couple of songs in the space. And all of a sudden, I start seeing all these Kowakas coming into my spaces and Bizzle, Live Dog and you know, Heather and, and Brett, everyone's pushing really, really hard for my mint. And I just got this huge wave of support from the Tribe Kowaka community. So I just started hanging out with them more and more and more. And I was lucky enough that Dick Dufus um, gifted me a Kowaka, which, you know, was incredible at the time for me, super valuable NFT, super valuable community. So yeah, and I'm, we've just been hanging out since then, you know? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, and by the way, amazing job last night in the um in the in the call. That was awesome. Your song, I got, just to just sit there on the spot and just play like that live was unbelievable. And so Thank you. it was so much fun. I loved it. Loved that metaverse. So that's how um your uh, in real life events take place a lot, right? You do Zoom concerts. Yeah, yeah. So I do Zoom concerts every Friday for my community. It's similar, kind of similar concept to the Kawaka meetups on Zoom, but more like music. So I have a um, special guest every week, like a different singer or songwriter musician to play a few songs. Then I play a few songs myself. And then we just have like a community meeting, you know, with updates and like just catching up and stuff similar to the Kawaka one. So that's one of the utilities that we offer for like holders of just like one NFT, you know, no matter which one it is. Uh, my community really loves it. It's a really good way to bond with each other and like get to a more personal level uh, with the founder and artist. But, um, you know, I I do a lot of like IRL concerts as well, you know, like in venues and and I'm I'm tour I've been touring my whole life and I'm I plan to tour now. Things are still calming down from the pandemic. So as soon as everything's back in, on track, you know, I'll be going on tour and the holders of my uh, songs, like if you hold five songs, you know, all of the songs, if you complete your album or you have some rarer traits, uh, frames in the in the collection, then you get lifetime free access to all my concerts. So, uh, and also like IRL events, like crypto conventions and NFT events and stuff. Uh, there's a few Koakas coming to this event in Florida I'm performing at, and I'm giving them a $400 ticket just for free and a plus one. I think Brett is coming, the Rangers coming, couple other people uh, because wow. they're holders you know so yeah, yeah that's amazing utility talk about utility on nft i mean uh you, with the what, what is it the gold the silver and the ruby yeah you have and, uh, or five songs or yeah. five songs wow yeah that's awesome yeah it's a really unique um idea for a utility right it's it's so cool and you know especially since your music is your first passion and then you married that with the nft collection so yeah i mean for your for your holders that's just awesome um positive q actually has a, a question for you he's done not only did he do his uh open c research but he also did his violetta zeroni research so he has a question he wanted to talk about so i i appreciate it thank you um so we were having a conversation before you came on about how it's nice for everybody to get together. Um, we had all gone out to dinner the other night, and a lot of times we get to know each other in a box. 
that we only talk about NFTs or Kawakas or collections and things like that. And that is just a, a microcosm of who we are. Um, so as you can tell, I like to research things. So I Google searched you for the first time today as I was doing the research for this. And um, I've never heard you bring it up in any space or anywhere I've seen you. And I apologize if it's something you don't like talking about, but I noticed you were a finalist on the X Factor Italy. And I was curious, not how you got there. It's obvious you got there because of talent, but what that experience was like for you. Um, yeah, uh, well, the reason, I guess the reason why I don't talk about it as much is because it happened so long ago that um, it's just, it just kind of almost like belongs to a different life. Uh, I, I I did participate to the X Factor Italy in 2013. I was 18 years old. I was still in high school. And yes, I got to the final and I, I was third in the end. And I signed a major label deal after that. Um, but like so many things happened afterwards that that kind of um, that kind of experience almost is forgotten. Although I have to say that it it was like my absolute starting point because be, wait you know right before that I was in school I was playing like local gigs I was in a band with my dad and like some friends you know it was very like unprofessional and then right after that I, it became my full-time job so what that really represented was going from just high school band to professional you know right after X Factor happened I pretty much dropped out of school. <laughs> like I, I did finish up in the end, but not really like in the traditional way. Um, but I focused 100% of my time on my music career. So it really represented the turning point. Uh, you know, I started like, you know, paying my taxes. And like, that's when I, I opened like, you know, a uh, proper uh, business kind of when I was 18. And um, the experience was amazing. Like I would do it over and over. Like if I could go back, you know, it was definitely what I needed. It gave me a huge overview on, you know, like zoomed uh, in into what like the real music industry looks like, especially on a national level, like in Italy, it's pretty small, but it's still big for someone who comes from a small town and has no experience. So um, it was definitely interesting to participate in a, in a TV show where you can see that nothing's real. And I'm saying it now, nothing's real. Okay. Wow. <laughs> Everything's yeah. scripted, yeah. Right. I mean, except for the contestants, like the actual talents don't know anything. Everyone else around them knows everything <laughs> except for the people. So I was clueless. I was just kind of following whatever was happening, but um, I did have some troubles while I was in the competition because I was very young and naive and I did not really realize that was a TV show. I thought it was a music contest. And so I approached it the wrong way. Right now I would approach it differently. Um, but I was very rebellious at the time. And, but it, it was amazing. Like I, I got to see how a real like TV studio works and recorded in real recording studios for the first time and work with incredible musicians, dancers, creative directors, like cameras, makeup and clothes. Like it was amazing, you know? Um, and it was funny because as, as I entered the X Factor, I was nobody. As I exited the X Factor three months later, people were stopping me in the street in like random cities to ask for selfies and my wow. songs were at the top of the charts. And I was like, cause the, the, the crazy thing about X factor, and I'm not sure if it's the same way in other countries, but in Italy, you are secluded for the entirety of the program. You don't have a phone. You don't have internet. You're in no contact with anyone outside. So you don't have access to the internet. So you're unaware of all the hype that is being created around you. Cause there's millions of people that watch that show. So you exit that house and you're a celebrity. So that was kind of a shock, but it opened up so many doors to me that, you know, I, I would always go back and do it again, you know? Wow. That, I mean, that was fascinating information. That was awesome. Um, so you, so you mentioned a couple of different instruments that you play. Um, you started playing the piano at what age? So I started playing piano at five, five years old. Yeah. Okay. And then you also play the guitar, which we saw last night. And, and you also play the ukulele. Is that your favorite? Not really. It kind of be became a thing because at the X Factor audition, I played the ukulele just randomly because the song required it. And then I became the girl with the ukulele. So that kind of became a thing. But 
um, the instrument I studied, like really studied with a classical like program was the piano. I did it for 11 years, uh, but I, I never felt really inspired by it because I had some really strict teachers and I couldn't find like my own inspiration and sound through the piano. Uh, so I, I can still play it, obviously, but it's not my main instrument. Main instrument became guitar because I got really into folk music and like, you know, uh, stuff like that. So, so yeah, guitar is, I would say, the instrument I'm most comfortable with now when it comes to accompanying myself. Yeah, and you're clearly very comfortable with it because you could just play like right at the drop of a hat in front of hundreds of people. Um, so what, what, who are some of your music influences? Um, so I really love like old jazz standards. So my, probably my favorite artist when it comes to like narrowing it down is Chet Baker. Um, so like really like classic jazz, like 1960s, very kind of soft, mellow. Um, so he's definitely my favorite. And then, then I love Nora Jones a lot. Um, and then there's a lot of like old Italian music that I really take a lot of inspiration from, whether it's like old traditional Southern Italian songs that come from opera, but they were kind of written in the streets of Naples in the 1860s or whatever, and then kind of spilled over into the 1900s and became classics or like French chanson and like you know, all that kind of stuff's really inspirational to me. It, it has a bit of opera influence to it, but also very kind of, you know, Arabic every now and then. The, the, the classic like Mediterranean, like storytelling sound. I really love that. And I try to incorporate it in my songwriting too. Nice. Okay. Um, so back to uh, the NFT collection. Do you, what do you, what do you have next on the horizon for, do you have another collection that you're planning to release? Absolutely. So first off, we have a, a mint coming up at the end of August. Uh, we will take a snapshot of the holders, just like for the utility, the holders of either five songs or ruby silver gold frames or nine frame holders. There's nine rarity tiers defined by the frames. So these kind of holders are going to have access to a free mint um, of either an NFT with the whole album attached to it that I think is going to become really valuable when it comes to like trading and selling for people who might not want to collect all five or just one, they're going to be able to pay maybe a little bit more to buy an 1155 with all the songs. So that's kind of the purpose. And for the nine frame holders, and there's only about 20 of them in the whole community, we're going to have some legendaries basically. So we're going to have um one for each song and just as many as there are nine frame holders with the acoustic version of one of the songs and the sketched version of the artwork that my dad that my dad drew the art right so the first og version so those are going to be only mintable to those kind of holders and once we're done with that mint we're going to auction off an extra five of those acoustic sketched versions with like some added traits to make them even more legendary. And we're going to auction them off like every week or every two weeks uh, until the end, until we've, we've auctioned off all five. Um, yeah. Just to give an opportunity to other people to get an extra special one um, after that. So, yeah. And we, we haven't really revealed whether we're going to do like a real, like a proper auction or Dutch auctions. We might actually, alternate just to make it more fun <laughs> so we'll see and then you know that's kind of um that's kind of in terms in terms of like you know um connected to moonshot and then i'm shipping out vinyls and posters to my holders and i have irl events and i have some added utility for some traits that i'm going to be working on in the autumn and then i'm working on my ex next album which is going to become another collection so that's kind of how i treat collections they're albums really you know they're collections yeah. of songs nice so, and it's it's a very interesting way of artists you know for artists to be able to monetize uh their work and uh not be tied up with uh bigger labels right absolutely i mean i i think um the most incredible things about music nfts is that even if there was a label involved the 
people, music lovers would be able to monetize off of the music they love. Yeah. And that's never been the case in history before. The fact that you can buy my song for 0 0.05 and sell it again after two months for triple that is incredible. That's, that's never point, happened. Yeah. And I you have know. to ask you this before uh, I forget. So, were you nervous uh, when you when like like when you released the you know the silver and the gold and the uh, the ruby frame because those are a lot of uh, you know lifetime free entrance to your concerts. And, and listen, I know people that hold your NFTs are all over the world, so uh, you know they're not going to be in every spot every time you want to do a concert. But like, I don't know. I feel I would have been nervous of giving out so many like that. It's amazing utility, you know. And what do you price that at? Like, what's the fair value of being able to have access to all your concerts for life, you know? Well, if you minted them, it was 0.05. You know? <laughs> yeah, no, but in your head, like, I, I was just curious to see what you thought about that. Well, for me, you know, for me, what, what the community did for me is priceless. So I, you know, and the collection is not huge. You know, the collection's only like 2,500 and there's only like a hundred and something rubies, you know? And so there's not like, you know, it's not like I'm, I'm given free access to everyone in the world, yeah. but I, I really wanted to reward those first people that believed in me as a founder and as an artist in this new adventure. So, um, you know, I love it. And I played a show in New York City during NFT NYC. And um, so many of them showed up with their NFTs in their wallet. And they're like, you know, moonshot number, whatever, silver frame. That's I got amazing. A yeah. A free ticket and a plus one. I'm like, come in and Boom. welcome home, you know? And, and like these people knew every word to my songs, you know, and it was the best night of my life. So, I, I want more of that, you know, that because like they do so much more for me than I do for them that, you know, none of this would be possible. So the least I can do is let them in for free, you know, that's awesome. That's a great man. answer. That's awesome. All right. So, um, you mentioned the, um, the legends that the legend that you're going to work on with your next collection. One of the things we do at the end of every czar cast is we ask our guests, who is a person, a famous person or celebrity or someone from history that you would like to see made into a tribe Kawaka legend in the future? Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> uh, I have a, such a great answer, guys. Uh, Billy Joe Armstrong from Green Day. Please. Pretty please. Wow. <laughs> We're going deep. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Billy Jeez, Joe. So Green Day, I didn't mention them as my inspiration, but they actually were because they're my favorite band ever in terms of like not so much inspiration, but like favorite band. Uh, I got I picked up the guitar because of them and um, and I love him so much. And he still like 15 years later, I'm still a fangirl. So, yes, 100 <laughs> percent. Nice. Well, yeah, the, the musicians, it's funny, they of all the legends that every time we ask this question, the musicians are in the lead with, with choices for, uh, for legends. So he joins uh, Marilyn Manson and ZZ top, right? Nice. Yeah. <laughs> That's uh, that is quite an eclectic band we have going on there. I I'd go to that concert. <laughs> Me too. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you um, for taking some time out of your day to come talk to us and um, you know, we'll let you know when this, when this airs and uh, hope you listen to it. And um, that's it for me. Positive Q or D22. Any other questions? Violetta, thank you very much for your time. It was a pleasure talking to you one on one or, you know, three to one for a little bit. But uh, I really enjoyed the, uh, the time. We appreciate you, you reaching out and jumping on with us. Yeah, same here, Violetta. I know we uh, we messaged through, uh, through Twitter. And yeah, it's, it's just like Positive Q said earlier, you work so hard and you're so available uh, for your fans, for your investors and uh, just uh, the NFT community as a whole. So we, we really uh, appreciate you taking time and getting here on, on the on the Zarcast with us. Thank you and so much. If you ever do want me to analyze the floor for you and go over it, I, I, I'm more than happy to. You don't have to worry about stealing me from the Zarcast. <laughs> I may have to take up on that. Honestly, I do have a couple of doubts and questions, so I will be getting in touch. Just, just friend, me, friend me on uh, Discord and we'll go over it. Yeah, Perfect. take them up on.
You won't be sorry. All right. Well, thank you again, Violetta. We loved having you as a guest. We hope to talk to you again soon. And I'm sure we'll be seeing you, you know, with other um, Tribe Kawaka meetups and, and spaces and things like that. So enjoy the rest of your day. Positive QD22, thank you for your thorough work and your reports today. And um, that is it for episode six, the music edition of the Czarcast. And I will see you all next week. Thank you, everybody. Have a great week. All right. Thanks, guys. See you later. Bye-bye.